Hello, my name is Marcus Addles with Athletics Director U. I'm here with Marianne Riley with Manhattan College and Nikki Moore, new to Colgate University. Um, the topic of today's conversation is the difference is culture. Uh, culture being a topic of conversation throughout our industry. Um, so I'm really interested to hear your thoughts and, and ideas on how you guys are implementing culture and, and building culture um, at your respective institutions. So with that said, we'll jump right into it. Um, famous management thinker, Peter Drunker once said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. In your opinion, what are the key components of organizational culture? Well, I'll dive in. Um, you know, I think culture is at the core of it about a shared set of values that everyone has agreed to live by. Um, there are, I think, layers of how culture is manifested and how it looks. Um, but, you know, I think a, a layer up from values are, are heroes, you know, and so regardless of whether you're talking athletics department develop or athletics department culture or a corporate culture or a religion, right. um, you've got so those values, you've got heroes, you've got, um, you know, rituals and you've got symbols and so, I think all of them um, play into what culture really is and how people experience it. Absolutely. Mary? Well, I look at culture, I, I don't know if I would have said it that way, but when you look at that statement, you say, yeah, it does, because without, um, without having people behind you um, and developing that culture that you want, your strategy and vision will never come to be. Right. Um, so some of the key components for me um, is communication, okay. um, listening, get, getting to know what works right, what doesn't in your organization. Um, and, and building that trust, because without trust, you don't have healthy relationships. Without healthy relationships, you're never going to have that culture. Absolutely. And um, one impacts the other. Absolutely, absolutely. How do you under, uh, come to understand, or how do you plan to learn your organization's culture uh, and inset, assess its intended and unattended effects um, from when you first took your position? Well, I started two years ago. And my organization was interesting. I had a little bit of a history um, because I am an alum. Okay. So I had some historical knowledge about the culture of the institution. Um, the culture of my department was slightly different. They had been through three athletic directors, one that had been a longstanding athletic director, uh, another one that had been there for a year and a half, and then the interim who held down the fort till I got there. And um, it was interesting. It, I would say it was a little fractured. Um, so before I instituted anything, I needed to sit and listen. So I met with all of our staff. I met everyone that touched the athletic department. Um, so I understood what was going on. And even though I knew the culture of the institution itself, there were things that I needed to find out about what my staff knew. Something as simple as when we were planning for men's basketball, and I said, so do the Christian brothers have their um, you know, press passes and tickets? And they all looked at me, and I'm like, that's a huge part of our culture of the institution. Right. And I think sometimes we just look at our department and we don't look at the institution itself. Mm -hmm. So it really was grassroots uh, going back, listening, and, and teaching them that these are some of the things that are important. Absolutely. Nikki, you're, you're new to your current role. So yeah. how do you plan on going uh, about learning your institution's mm -hmm. culture and really assessing um, the culture uh, at Colgate? Yeah. It started in the interview process. and. Uh, you know, I think that I've learned how important um, fit is in actually determining whether or not um, the set of values that I bring to the table is going to fit within the culture of the institution. So, you, you know, you're trusting the president, you're trusting the search committee, um, you're trusting your predecessor in some way um, to, to, to believe that that's a right fit. So I think the assessment process starts mm -hmm. there. Um, and, uh, and then it's ongoing, it's observing everything, it's looking at um, what types of things are posted online, it's right. looking at the website, it's um, you know, looking at the stories that they're mm -hmm. telling about themselves. Um, and then the more active things that I've begun to do and, and really I've been on, on the ground uh, for a fairly short time now, um, but is doing interviews, doing one-on-one -on -one, um, interviews, asking the same set of questions across individuals, um, you know, hearing what they believe are important cornerstones for them and why they chose to be at Colgate and, uh, and those sorts of things. So I think it'll be a, a great process of building upon that and, uh, and then just shaping and guiding it and making it perhaps 
um, amplifying the culture. Certainly, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, to follow up on that, how do you evaluate the level of consistency um, in your employees' views um, as you try to implement your culture? Oh. Well, I think some of those you know, asking and listening and, um, and also ob observing how people respond and behave to challenges and questions and, and um, you know, it's, I, I think I'm really pleased to see that there's a level of consistency in how um, my staff seems to be thinking about certain problems. And so that to me is a, a pretty healthy indicator that there is a, there's an underlying culture there. But, um, but it's, it'll be ongoing, okay. you know, and, and a really important part of, of what we do. Okay, good deal. Um, <clears throat> Mary Ann, um, when you arrived at Manhattan, I'm sure there were, there were subcultures, uh, whether they improved um, or, or uh, worsened group performance. Can you talk a, a little bit about um, how you were able to bring everybody to your vision and, and build our vision uh, you know, at, at Manhattan? Okay. <laughs> um, well, there's always subcultures. They're always going to exist, um, whether they strengthen or weaken you always have to manage that. And I think that's managing by walking around, observing much of what Nikki was saying before. Um, it's about knowing the culture of the institution, knowing the culture of your department, and then the subcultures within that department, even if it's just the areas of your department, each operate differently. And um, some of the things that we instituted were more one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, group meetings, senior staff meetings, so that we, we stay within our, our, our circle that we're trying to create with that culture. Um, but it, it goes down to as far as being prepared with our events and our constituencies, our alumni, our fan base, and, and keeping them uh, engaged so that we see that culture drifting into that area as well as our student athletes with SAC um, and making sure that we keep those lines of communication open so that our student athletes also feel that culture change. Absolutely. Uh, do you have a follow up? Um, you know, I think it's important to find out who are the culture bearers okay. um, in your organization and in the university. Um, who are those uh, individuals, groups right. who are very influential as it relates to how people feel about being in that place or how people identify um, as a member of that community. So I'm, I'm still learning that, mm -hmm. um, but I, it's going to be very important for me to connect with those culture bearers, mm -hmm. um, you know, as quickly as possible and, and, and learn how I can, again, either amplify or help guide and shift. Have you begun to think about uh, how you'll address uh, certain situations where um, a certain subculture may undermine your mm -hmm. particular values? Um, in, in previous experiences, what I have found is that um, generally people aren't trying to be subversive. Um, and oftentimes those subcultures develop because they have been presented with a set of challenges um, at one time or another. It might have been 10, 15 years ago. And sometimes subculture behavior is a relic of a policy or a decision that was made or a way of doing things that was that was done a long time ago. And so helping them and, and listening to them describe why. Why do you do things the way you do it? Or, or why is this policy in place? Or why do you, be, you know, in this way or that way? Um, it is really helpful for them to start to understand. Because when you've been in it for a while, you don't know it. You don't know that you've been operating that way for those reasons. So um, helping people get to their why and helping them to maybe try to buy into to my why or our why, um, I think will be the approach that I'll take. Certainly. Along those same lines, how have you included people to, to build um, your culture? Are there specific measures that you've taken, meetings, uh, strategic planning? Is there anything in particular that you've done um, to include people as you, as you all have built your culture together? Well, I feel like we have. Okay. We really have. And, and it's year two. Okay. So now we're going to really buckle down with more of the strategic planning because I feel that we have the culture that we want. Mm -hmm. um, but we did that by embracing new employees with veteran employees, knowing that one ha could teach the other 
on both sides, um, having activities, creating that competitive environment because I think all of our mm -hmm. juices go mm -hmm. uh, forward when Absolutely. we have a little competition. So we, we do a lot of competition um, in our department. Mm -hmm. We have um, outings that include families because you know, mm. our work-life balance is challenged all the time. So it's good when we can include our family um, and, you know, running different activities Absolutely. with our student athletes. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Yeah. My last question for you, um, what goes into designing an aspirational culture and communicating the changes necessary to achieve it? Mm. Great question. Um, we, have, we have a motto, be, always be prepared for success. And so everything that we do, um, we try to always have that on our minds whether we're preparing for the upcoming season, whether we're pre planning for events, um, you know, getting ready for a pregame activity. Um, so we have people that have bought into the mm -hmm. culture. We have that as our motto. And I think, um, you know, it's tweaking it along the way. It's managing by walking around, making sure that everybody's on the same page and listening. And then those that aren't, we talk about it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Nikki, what about you? What goes into an aspirational culture? I think you have to be really clear about what you're trying to get to and describing that but then also living it. Um, modeling is one of the most powerful ways of teaching. And so I hope to really model the kind of um, culture, if you will, behaviors that I hope to see in, in our staff, and also set up uh, those things that we have in our in our day-to-day -day life, whether it's our division meetings or our senior staff meetings or, again, the activities that, that you mentioned. Um, ensuring, you know, for example, I hope that we have a will have an empowered culture. You know, where our staff and, and student athletes and, and leaders uh, feel very empowered to be leaders. Um, and so, our first division meeting, um, I asked a lot of participation um, from from the staff, and I think that's just one of the ways to to reinforce um, what you're looking for and, and to become be clear about what you expect. And thank you for coming. <laughs>